we're going to uh, look at finally what the Lord put in my heart for today. I had something else in mind, and he just uh, said, how about this? Okay. We have been going through uh, quite a bit of uh, trials, tribulations. Yes? yes? Now you can raise your hand. Yeah, I've been going through quite a bit of trials, and I think we'll get some fingers up on that one, eh? And so they look like giants to us, or a giant wall. Have you ever felt like that? Yep. There's a big, hard wall there. And so I made this up. If you can see it. I took a picture of some stone, of a stone wall, and I put words there. Matter of fact, can you back up, uh, 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 Beverly? Two. Are you able to back up if you're not not to worry? Back there. We want to be, we want to overcome this. Stuff. Yes. Oh, would you like to stay where you are? I mean, I'll, you, you can. God will let you. You want to slither around in self pity? Help, help, help yourself. But there's a way to overcome. And so that's what we want to talk about today. We want to tell you know, um, my little grandson who is now six feet in, in high school, but when he was about two feet like Michael's size. Uh, we were in church in Michigan, and he loved to sit up front. All grandkids sit up front with me because my daughter and all they never flew up in the church band. And so they liked to sit on the front seat, and boy, did he like to sing praise and worship. He would get up, you know, a little bitty thing. So we bought him a karaoke mic, and that just did it, because he could get up and out. And his mic. Well, one day, our friend Larry came in and sat with us, and Larry's about 6'3". And so David comes in from Sunday school, and he, and he walked up to us, and there Larry sat in his seat. <laughs> he says, that's my seat. Didn't hesitate. That's my seat. <laughs> you know, he had to really strain this to see his, and he had no problem getting right up to Larry and saying, that's my seat. Larry said, okay. <laughs> Wasn't afraid at all. And then a few days later, my son's friend came over to visit. And Jeff is about is taller than that, I believe. And he walked in and, and uh, tall, Viking looking, blonde hair. And he walked in and, and David has to do like this again. And he looks at Jeff and looks all the way up at Jeff and he says, I'm gonna cut your hair off in the name of the Lord. <laughs> I guess he had to be any giant, any giant, any giant, I can handle. Wouldn't it be nice to have an opinion like that, to live like that? Any giant that comes in my life, I can handle. Do you hear that? Would you like to get to that place? Any giant. Now it's, see, we, but we have a feeling like this. We're overwhelmed. <laughs> we feel overwhelmed. Sometimes the burdens are just so much that they just are pulling you back. Just wiping you off your feet type thing. Is that, is that how you feel sometimes? Yeah. What's that commercial? Is that how you feel with feet? Well, let's talk about it. Now let's go to this, to us. There we are, standing in front of this wall of, of all of this stuff that we have to deal with. Now, we just sang the song, I Stand in Love. It didn't say how tall we were when we, when we stand in love. We said we stand in Christ Jesus in love. So, how does that mount up to standing against that wall? And I put some words in there. You know, some of us feel hopeless. Some of us feel insecure. Some of us feel hatred. Some of us feel rejection, mistrust. I even put not in one little corner, way really over. Just not. I'm not this, I'm not, I just not. How do you feel? Not good. Trapped. There's debt. There's a past that, that looms over us. We have grudges, we have anxiety, sickness. 
we feel alone. And then I put down in the bottom corner, you can, I put it so that you can barely see them because sometimes they're lurking in the darkness in our soul. Yes? And so I put way down their nets. We have little nets. Do you know what a net is? I don't either, but it's a little thing that just keeps gnawing. Right? Those little nets. And there we are, down at the bottom of that, saying, you know, this is an insurmountable wall. I have so many things to deal with. I've been there more times than I can count. As my parents would say, more times than I have fingers and toes. Yes? Hmm. What should we be? How should we look? We need to stand there and say, all right, who's going down first? Because all of you are going down. I'll take you all down together. Yeah? Are you ready? Because now you're not going to be in my life to the point that you're ruling me. I'm not going to submit to you. And, and so I thought, well, how do we get there? And, and the one word that came to me was prepared. We need to be, if it happens right now, and you haven't been, and you haven't prepared yourself for it spiritually, guess what? Uh, we're in trouble. You know? You're in trouble. You need to be prepared spiritually for whatever is going to happen. Jesus said to the disciples, you know, it's not going to be easy, my interpretation, right? So we need to be prepared so that we can pull out the reserve. Hello? Yes. All right. Let's, what does prepare mean? Let's look. To prepare is to make ready beforehand for some approaching event, need, and the like. It's to be properly expected, organized, or equipped, ready. And I'm not talking about back in the 50s or 60s where we would go around and say, come out of there, you devil. You know, I'm just anticipating the deliverance out of this table and everywhere. I am not talking about that, okay? I'm talking about being prepared in the Lord. Okay, just to make it clear. To be at the ready. Any military people in here? What does that mean, to be at the ready? Well, people that are in Afghanistan, Pakistan, yeah, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, wherever there we have troops, some of them sleep with their weapons, yeah? Some of them know how to clean the weapons in the dark. Some of them know their weapons so well that they don't have to be... The, your brother will be learning that in boot camp. Yes. That uh, uh, they, they don't have to look. They can handle that in the dark. They know that weapon well enough. Can I say that again? They know that weapon well enough. How well do we know God and God's word? Okay. So, it's a matter of being prepared. And so then I asked myself, I said to myself, so, what does it, what, what prepared David to meet the lion? There is a giant. Simple story. All of us know this story, but we need to know it again. As Peter says, I, I don't have a problem reminding you again. So, what prepared David to meet the lion? And you know the story. He was out there and he was talking and he killed a giant. But what happened to him beforehand that made him that strong? Well, he had a grandmother that was a Moabitess. That's good news and bad news. Ruth is in his lineage. But there were still those that didn't like Moabites and said, you know, that kid over there, you know, his great grandmother, she, he's got Moabite blood in Do we, you know, those people over there, they think they're so. I don't have anything to do with that person because she. We've been scorned in that way more times than, 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 than not. I used to go to the store sometimes and, 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 and the people waiting on people at the store, the clerks, invariably would pass me by. And then I, you know, I was going to get, I was mad. I won't tell the story and say I was going to get, I was mad. But then I, I came to a realization, you know what I realized? I'm invisible. <laughs> this is so cool. I'm invisible. That's why they can't see me. I should make a movie. You understand what I'm saying? Have you ever had that feeling that nobody...
nobody notices you. Nobody cares whether you exist or not. Nobody talks to you. you you're just invisible. You're not existent. The phone doesn't ring. You know, nobody gives you a hug. Nobody says, you know, I've been thinking, I was thinking about you today. How you, how you doing? And suddenly that feeling of isolation comes in. Well, and, and, you know, you, and you wonder about David because surely there were those that said, you, they say, oh, look at that David. He's a shepherd. Well, well you know that his, uh, you know what's in his name? Did you hear the story about that? Hmm. Did, you know about that, don't you? And there are those that won't let it go. And I'll just leave that out there. He was the youngest of eight boys. He had to bear that. There were seven in front of him. Does that make any sense to you? Seven in front of him. So he was relegated to take care of the sheep. His other brothers got a chance to go serve in Saul's army. But he had to go. And so as being a shepherd, taking care of his father's sheep, what does that involve? It involves being in uh, the wilderness or bad country, a bad place where there could be robbers. Robbers, lions, and bears, oh my. Mm -hmm. yeah. See? And he was out there and he learned the responsibility of taking care of sheep alone. Mm -hmm. He wasn't dependent on anyone, but the good news was it gave him some time. So I have good news and bad news. This is what really hurt David. David is anointed in front of his family, and I want you to note that it was done before he met Goliath. First Samuel 16, 6, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. Do not consider his appearance or his height. Do not consider his appearance or his height. Don't use your eyeball. Do, do we have people that judge us just with their eyeballs? Yeah. You know, when you stop being invisible, <laughs> people say, oh, 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 ooh. <laughs> How is she going to work here? You get that? Okay. You understand what I'm saying? Ooh, oh. But God says, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord, what? So I really need to be prepared for prayer. Yeah, it's, it's not going to do me any good with the Lord if I dress up for him every day. You know, go out and buy a new outfit and say, hey, how do you like this one, Jesus? You know, that, that's really not working for me. Because God says, you know, I'm looking on your heart. And if your heart is prepared, I'm with you. Hello? See, so, and how, how do we know that God, that uh, uh, God deemed David as one after his own heart? Well, farther back. In 1 Samuel 13, farther back. In 1 Samuel 13, 14, uh, he's talking to Samuel. He says, but now your kingdom will, or Samuel is talking to uh, Saul. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. He's looked for, sought out, and then the next word says, and appointed him. That means he looked for one, looked at hearts, sought him out, and appointed him. He already knew who David was and had selected him. This is before Goliath. This is this is before any of this. This is before David knew. This is before Samuel knew. This is before the brothers knew. All of this, he says, he selected Solomon on his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's commandment. So the, the problem is, look, he was known that's, that's really good. And but he, he did not have influence with his family. And the thing is, he was anointed before in the presence of his brothers. He was anointed in the presence of his brothers. Does that remind you of Joseph? 
Joseph said, I had a dream, you know, all of you are going to serve me. <coughs> and as new as he think he is, he pushed him down in the pit. And they were all in agreement. Except for Reuben says, don't kill him. So now here we have David. And Samuel was standing before the brothers. No, no, no. You know, and they're going, <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> and they said, don't you have another one? Well, yeah, we got that ruddy kid out there in the fields that's uh, 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 tending the sheep. He said, well, I, I won't sit down. I won't, I won't rest until you bring him. He steps in the Lord said, that's him. I know him. And in front of his, his family was the first to know. Were they proud? I don't know. But they didn't treat him like they were. That's the point. And not long after that, he went into the service of Saul, playing his harp. And that's what this is. He was known. Um, Saul was having a problem. And they said, well, let's find someone that can play music for you. And he says, well, who can you get? And it's 1 Samuel 16, 18. says, one of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre, the harp. <laughs> and listen to how they describe him. He's a brave man and a warrior. How did they know that? He's out in the fields, tending sheep. How did that word get back? That he's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. How did they know all of that? What do people know about me? Word of mouth. What do people know? What? Word of mouth. Word of mouth. But what do people know about me? How do I carry myself so that the word of mouth is a good word rather than a bad word? How, how am I carrying myself so that the word of mouth that goes around is like this word of mouth? He's a warrior. He speaks well. He's a, well, he's a good looking. Maybe that won't about He's a well and he's fine looking man. And the Lord is with him. How will people know that the Lord is with him? How, how, would I, how do I carry myself so that the Lord, people would know? Or when they look at me, do they see me still looking for the slingshot so I can kill the giant? Has anybody seen my slingshot out here anywhere? Never mind, I don't know how to use it anyway. So, David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. That probably didn't bode well with him being chosen, anointed, and then going in the service with Saul to be his armor bearer because the other brothers were in the troops. Hello? Yeah. You know, you, have you ever felt like there's times that you just can't win? <laughs> take one step this way, take one step that way, and that brick wall, stone wall, keeps coming up. So then we have a champion. Here we have the life. It says, a uh, champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height, uh, take a look at this. His height was six cubits in a span. A cubit is an arm length, about 18 inches. Six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale of armor of bronze and 5,000 shekels. On his legs were, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod. And his iron point weighed 600 shekels. That's an, an awesome or fairy sight, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And the people are looking up to that and you hear, it's just like in the movies, you know, you hear this clump, clump, clump. And the funny part, the ironic, funny part about it is they would array themselves against each other every day. Forty days, they'd get up and all line up, you know, and look at each other and do nothing. <laughs> Have you done that? And you said, well, today I'm going to fight. Today is the day that I'm going to conquer that wall and that giant. Yep. Amen. But then tomorrow looks a little bit better. Have you done that? 
So they're looking at this giant, and uh, first uh, Samuel 17, 11 says, on hearing the Philistines' words, because he threatened them, he says, why don't you send someone out to face me? You send someone out. You know, and I'm sure his voice was just as big as he was. Send someone out to face me. And it says, upon hearing the Philistines' words, <laughs> Saul and the Israelites took their armor up and ran and killed them. No. They didn't do that. It says, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. That's their response. They backed off. Are there things in our lives that terrify us so that we don't feel we can even fight? That's the question. We're talking about giants in our lives. And we're talking about, is there something, are there things in my life that, that I've determined I can't even fight? It's not going to do any good anyway. If you reach that point. See, there's one point of, I can't even fight, but then there's further down the road, it's not going to do any good anyway. That's a little bit further down. So, then David goes into the, the fray. 1 Samuel 17, 20. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to, to the battle positions, shouting the war cry. But that's really cool. You shout a war cry, you <laughs> you know, back, back in the 50s and 60s, they used to say, shout at the mountain. Shout, you heard, remember that song? And they shout at the mountain. Shout grace at the mountain. And everybody would stand up in church and go, grace! And then they go home and say, boy, I just wish that, you know, I You know what I'm saying? Mountain's still there. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> I mean, I do it so many times until I'm laughing at myself. <laughs> All right, first Samuel 28, when Iliad, David's oldest brother, heard David speaking, because David comes in and he says, What's going on? What's happening? And he says, Well, don't you see what the guy's saying? This, and if somebody kills him, Saul's going to do this. And David says, Really? So when Iliad, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him. Well, there's a loving brother. And ask, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. Oh, really? You can now look on heart. You came down only to watch the battle. And David says, now what have I done? Have you, did you feel that way at times? Well, I, I tried this. And that didn't work, and Dad sent me down here, and I'm trying this, and that doesn't work. You're mad if I'm gone, and you're mad if I'm here. What can I do? And do you have that feeling about the giants in your life? I've tried this, I've tried that, I've tried fasting, I tried reading my Bible verses every day, I tried praising, I tried all this, and it didn't. Have you ever said that? Have you ever said that? And it didn't? work. Ooh. You were doing it to make it work. Ooh. I did too. And it didn't work. Oh. And so David, you know, David's standing there, standing there saying, you want to be mad at somebody, why don't you be mad at those people you're not fighting? You want to be mad at somebody, why don't you get mad at that giant? Go kill him. Now all of this is happening and you're going to turn around and be mad at it. Me? Things in your life happen that, that just seem stupid. You know, everything is happening. All these giants are happening. And then somebody calls you and says, well, why didn't you do that? Step back, please. Because that would be the camel that breaks my back. You know, I'm dealing with 55 giants. And things are going through my head. And somebody says, you know, well, all you need to do is, Step back. <laughs> Step way back. No, be angry. Let's fight together. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
You know, I, I know that you're dealing with a, a great deal, and I'm sorry to hear that. How can I pray with you? How can I help you? But please don't come up and say, why didn't you? And why don't you? You know my least favorite word in the English language is? You. Okay. Now here's something. I didn't uh, put that script, leave, leave that there. Uh, but here's something. Um, First Samuel 1720 says, early in the morning, or I have that there, um, David left his flock in the care of a shepherd. And just a thought. Just a thought. But think about this. David leaves his flock in the care of an under shepherd while he goes and ends up fighting the enemy. Just a thought. Just, just leave that dangle up there for a minute. Just, okay, you can chew on that. I chewed on it and it was so good. Okay. It says, whenever the Israelites saw the men, they all fled from him in great fear. That was 1724. And then in 1726, David uses some unusual language. I'm going to read it to you here. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? And then he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Why would he say something like that? What, what was he referring to? Do you know? How do you know whether it was uncircumcised or not? Come on now. Was he, a he was a Gentile. He was a Gentile. But what did that mean to David and should have meant to the rest of the Israelites? Covenant. Circumcision was the sign of covenant. See, we just started a Sunday school class on covenant. God says, as a sign, you know, we're going to cut these animals, and then later in 17, he comes back and says, now, for your part, I want you to be on the eighth day circumcised. They were different. They had the cut, the scar of circumcision on their body. Not only did they have the cut or the scar of circumcision, they knew who they belonged to because of that scar. Every time they would notice the scar of circumcision, that would be a good reminder. Hello? So he knew that this guy was a Gentile, but more so uncircumcised, more so not God's people. And not only that, he knew he was. See? He was. I told you about Harold taking Josiah when he was little to the store and, jo and Josiah was standing there just looking at the horse. He put a quarter in and his dad was over at the counter talking to the clerk and this other little boy was sitting there you know like you can't get on that horse. You don't have a quarter, and you're too little. And Josiah's looking at him when he was real little, and he just he just backed up, never turned around, just backed up. And there was his dad. He knew that. And his dad picked him up and put him on the horse. And Josiah looks back at the guy like, <laughs> I'm talking about covenant. I'm talking about knowing who you are and knowing to whom you belong. That's what Paul says. The God of whose I am. Shipwreck. That's not about me. The God of whose I am. I don't care how many of you are here that don't know him. I'm on this boat. This boat is not going to sink. The God of whose I am will save us. See, that's standing in love. Now, we say we love God. We say we have covenant. But do we in love. I know who I am. I know who my last name. You know, when we were big, when we raised our kids and when I was being raised, we'd say, you've got to be like a croft. And they go, okay. What does that mean? <laughs> hey, hey, did your family tell you that? You represent the cross. You represent not the croft. You represent the whomever your words, words are. The point being, David knew who he was and who that giant 
What's that to you? You need to know who you are and what that wall and what those giants in your life are not. Once we get that down, Pico, oh, it's covenant speaking. It's covenant speech. So David, uh, uh, let's do the next one. You've got 1745, or is it 34 that you have over there? Let me see what I have here. Yes. David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping the father's sheep. Saul is saying, you can't go out there and kill that giant. He said, yeah, let me tell you about myself. Let me tell you about myself. He said, I've been keeping the sheep, and I've been, um, um, I killed a lion and a bear. And I went off and struck it, and, and I'm skipping because we're getting short on time. And I rescued the sheep from its mouth, and when it turned, when the lion and the bear turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and killed it. Now, how many of you have had God work in your life some kind of way once? Hands up. How many of you have had God work in your life some kind of way twice? Hands up. And you knew it was God. Yes? Now, we can do that. We can handle that in one of two ways. We can say, yeah, I remember that God did this for me. I, I, I remember. Yep. And then we have to scratch our brains to remember. Or we can do like David did. We can say, he delivered me from the lion. He delivered me from the bear. And boy, I'm going to cut your head off in the name of the Lord. <laughs> we just cracked up because I don't know David said that. And if, there's two ways to look at the giants in our lives. We can either succumb, we can surrender, or we can go in denial. Oh, that's really not that bad. It really is that bad when we go into denial. That's really bad. Oh, it isn't that bad. I, I can deal with it. Mm -mm. Or we can say, I I am a member of the circumcision. That's what that's what Galatians says, doesn't it? Is that what Galatians says? You are that of the circumcision? It's, it's us. And we can stand and claim those promises and say, well, I know my name. Now, giant, you're going to have to leave me alone. You can stay there. You can go. I'm not, I don't know what's going to happen. But what I do know is I have changed. Mm. See, I'm not telling you that every giant in your life is going to go away. But I'm telling you that you suddenly can know your name and change and say, oh, did you want to stay around? Well, come on and go to church with me. Come on and do praise and worship with me. Would you like to stay for that? I'm serious. You know, and I've got to close shortly, and, and I, don't, I don't want to. David says, this day, the next slide, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and to the wild animals. And, and so, let me finish the scriptures and then I want to say something to you. And I'm going to take an extra few minutes to say that to you. But the next scripture that I have there for you, and it's very important that I, I do this last part. But the next scripture I have there for you is for us to be able, uh, in Hebrews 4.16, let us then, next slide, uh, okay. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we, we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We have to be able to go there. We don't we can't just sit around and say, Oh Lord, help me, please, oh we have to be able to go there. And then first John 5 14, this is the confidence. The confidence. The confidence like David had, the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. And then the next slide, we know these scriptures in Romans. Who's for, if God is for us, who's against us? We know these scriptures. We know that according to the last verse, there neither might for him. 38, for I'm convinced, are you convinced? For I'm convinced, are you convinced 
that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, big walls, stones, will be able to separate us from where we first started when we spoke this morning, from the love of God, standing in the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, I want to I want to say say this one thing to you, and then we're going to dismiss. My two sons were talking. We were visiting in Michigan on our way back here, and Harold, the one that is now resident director, was talking to his older brother, and his older brother has a very high IQ and would like for you to know it. And, uh, <laughs> reminds us all the time. Um, and he's very logical. And so we were talking, and, 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 and Harold was pressing, pressing, trying to get to his brother. You know, and he was saying, yes, but you have to have a relationship. And, and my, the older son knows the scriptures, and he says, oh, yes, well, that just means her literally. And, and, and again, Harold was saying, yes, but you see, there's Eli and Harold likes to do parables like I do, and he was going to Elijah and this and that and the other. And, and my oldest son finally said, well, you know, God is love. And you just have to know about his grace. That's the important thing is grace. And the Spirit of the Lord hit me like a lightning bolt. And I said, what do you know about his grace? I haven't said that much before. I'm just sitting there enjoying the back and forth, you know. And Harold was getting ready to say something I just like. I'm the mom, I'm the oldest. What do you know about his grace? And, and, and my son said, well, what do you mean? Just, just world. And I said, I'm going to tell you the greatest picture that I know of God's grace. I said, I know and can see God's grace when I see God telling Abraham, go get the animals. And Abraham gets the animals and he cuts them in half. And he's thinking that he's going to be walking through these animals because that's how you cut covenant. But the next thing Abraham knows is that he's on the ground, terrified, and, and, and a, as in a sleep, and there's a pop and a furnace and smoke going through these parts. And I'm seeing God's glory because he chose to cut covenant both for, for both parties, for himself and for Abraham. He knows that he's taking the curse upon himself. He knows that man is going to break covenant. He knows that he's going to have to take that person, pay that price, and yet he's walking through those parts. And suddenly the Lord showed me that and I could see God's glory because he did it willingly walking through those parts knowing that in the new covenant his son would also pay that price and shed his blood. And he took that curse then in the old covenant and the son paid the, paid the price in the new covenant. And I saw, and I'm saying this to my son. And I said, and I saw God's glory. And for the first time since I've ever known my son, oh, I've known him all his life. <laughs> <laughs> he had nothing to say. And I saw it go in. Do you understand what I'm saying? I preached the gospel to him through the Old Testament because the gospel is in the Old Testament. And I told him that all I can do when I see that all we could do this morning when we saw the promises was to praise God. Now I want to read you a definition because I don't want us to get to the place. I'm going to read this to you. It says, uh, as we speak of, of rule of thumb, and my parents used to say, oh, I mean, the rule of thumb is, there's a the rule of spirit. I wrote this. Actually, the rule of covenant is that God keeps covenant. When I'm down, when I can't feel, when I don't want to feel, when I've been hurt, when I have been the offender, I know I can go into the temple, into my heart, 
and inquire of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, David says it many times in the Psalms. But David said this about the giants. He says he's come here to defy us. He brings division among us. He didn't use that word. But here's the Israelites. They're out one day. Yeah! And then they're back the next. Back next. And then they're out. Yeah! And then they're back the next. Disunity. The giants that I face can cause me to be divided within myself. And I want to read to you the definition of division. A double-minded man is a man of two souls or of a double heart that speaks and asks with a heart and, and, and heart as in Psalm 12 too, who walks between two opinions. And the word says, why, why do you walk between two opinions? And it is at an uncertainty to do or say and is undetermined what to ask for or who is not sincere and upright in his request, who asks for one thing and means another and asks amiss and with an ill design, does not call upon God in truth and in the sincerity of his soul, draws nigh to him with his mouth and honors him with his lips, but his heart is far from him. Such a one is unstable in all his ways. He's confused in his mind, restless in his thoughts, unsettled in his designs and intentions, inconstant in his petitions, uncertain in his notions and opinions of things, and very variable in his actions, and especially in matters of religion. He's always changing and never at a point, but at a continual uncertainty, both in a way of thinking and in doing. He never continues long either in an opinion or in a practice, but is ever shifting and moving. What does James say about that? Like a wave being tossed to and fro. This day, here's this pile here. I really believe God for all of this pile. But this pile over here is the bus. Do you have a yes but pile? Mm -hmm. See, this is pile. Oh yes, I know God can do this. I know God can do that. Oh, do you believe God can do that? Well, yes, but, you know, this is really Yes, but I don't see a way out. Yes, but uh, everything is against me. Do you have a yes, but Kyle? That pile can cause us to stand divided and have a divided mind. And it can cause us to be unstable when we're standing up against the wall of giants. Hello? Today, we can do this. We sang this song that says, We stand in the love of God. And as we close this day, Lord, we thank you that you give us a spot to stand on. We thank you that we can stand in your love and in your covenant. We thank you that we know who we are in you. And Lord, to this day, we choose to take this pile of yes buts and move them over to the pile of yes I believe. We know that you are a rewarder of the people, of us, that believe that you are God. And so we choose to have you as God over every one of the things that has been difficult for us to release because we can't see. Father, forgive us. For trying to see when you're the one that has the long eye. Forgive us for not trusting you when we choose to. We have to know how it's going to work out. Forgive us for that. Lord, trust and faith is you did this, you did this, and of a certainty you will do that. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. I love you. Pastor. Glory be to